When Ahsoka and Captain Rex are returning on the ship from Mandalore, Ahsoka gazes out the window and suddenly senses an immense disturbance of the Force. She senses that Anakin is about to do something unthinkable. On the command deck, a transmission sent from Palpatine to the 501st plays. Executes Order 66. Without hesitation, Captain Rex replies, Yes, Lord Sidious. Ahsoka rushes onto the command deck. Rex, it's Anakin. I know, interrupts Rex. What's going on? Ahsoka asks, shocked and confused. She looks around and sees the entire 501st take off their helmets. No time to explain, Commander. We must get you to safety now. Ahsoka, you, along with all of the other Jedi, are in danger. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if the 501st had removed their inhibitor chips? Have you ever thought about whether they would have listened to Fives and actually followed through with taking out those chips and ensuring that they never followed Order 66? Well, my friends, that's the scenario that we'll be exploring today. So grab a big cup of Bantha brew, grab a big bowl of Bantha stew, get comfortable, and get ready, because this is going to be a wild ride through the idea of what if the 501st had removed their inhibitor chips. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, Anakin marches with the 501st towards the Jedi Temple to carry out Order 66. Anakin stands in front of the doorstep of the Jedi Temple. He stands tall and starts to give orders to kill all of the Jedi inside the temple younglings included. The 501st stand in awe of what their beloved commander is telling them to do, and they suddenly realize that it was time. What Fives had told them all along was true. Immediately after Fives was killed, Captain Rex could not stop thinking about what he was implying. He also thought about his encounter during Fives and how Anakin's actions were unusually defensive. So behind Anakin's back, he went to find out the secrets behind the clone creation, which he later discovered. He believed Fives about Order 66 and the inhibitor chip, and that would lead them to be unable to resist Palpatine's every order. Horrified, enraged, dumbfounded, he immediately called upon the 501st and told them about this secret. Some of them questioned the sanity of their captain, but all of them agree that if this is true, it would mean they could be responsible for the destruction of the galaxy. Soon enough, in order to prevent the possibility of a galactic genocide, and in order to listen to their old comrade Fives, all of the clones agree to damage and remove their inhibitor chips in secret. Jumping back to the present, Anakin stands in front of the 501st, frustrated. Why are his loyal troops not responding to his command? How could you do this? screams Anakin. Anakin, listen. There's no way that this is what you're making us do. This is not the commander that we followed for the entirety of the Clone Wars. Commander Apo rose up as a representative to the 501st. How dare you defy my orders? I am your superior officer! Screams Anakin. Listen to yourself, sir. What are you doing? Commander Apo tries to calm Anakin down. This isn't you. If you are not with me, Apo, then you are my enemy. Don't make us do this, sir. You will try. Fine. I'm sorry, everyone. Fire upon my command. All the troopers raise their weapons and aim at Anakin. Anakin ignites his lightsaber. Fire! The troops begin shooting at Anakin. They struggle against the mighty Vader. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, from behind the gates of the Jedi Temple, some Jedi intervene in the battle. Keller and Beck and Sindralig emerge from the gates. This surprise attack stuns Anakin, and with that advantage, they can contain the rogue Jedi. At least, for now. Anakin struggles, but it's no use. They place handcuffs on him. Good work, Commander Apo, says Sindralik. We'll take it from here. The situation is worse than you think. We need to reinforce the temple right now, Apo exclaims. Understood. We will barricade the temple immediately, said Sin. Please tell us everything once you know that the coast is clear. Back on Ahsoka's ship, Rex is filling her in on what he had discovered. He starts to tell her all of his revelations. You knew? This whole time? Why didn't you tell us earlier? We could have stopped Anakin a lot sooner, Ahsoka screams. I just couldn't believe it, Commander. I just didn't think that Anakin would be open to such a plot. 
I'm sorry I didn't do anything sooner. I take full responsibility. Rex answers. One of his loyal troopers jumps in to defend Rex. But thankfully, he told us to fry the chip just in case. We hope that Anakin is not the type of person that would lead us to genocide. To be honest, we did it for fives. Another trooper interjects. Ahsoka looks around. She might have a lot of questions now, but all she sees is a group of loyal clone troopers. In that moment, that's all that she could ask for. Look guys, he did what you needed to do. Let's let bygones be guns. We need reinforcements to help our troops at the temple, Ahsoka exclaims. Let's head back to Mandalore, see if we can find anyone there. Ahsoka also adds, find any more Jedi survivors. We'll need as many reinforcements as we can. Yes ma'am, screams the whole contingent of the 501st. Rex salutes her. Once we get our reinforcements, we will return to Coruscant to bring Anakin and Palpatine to justice. The 501st is now hyped up, and they are ready to avenge Fives. As each trooper goes towards their station, Ahsoka can hear an eerie voice in the back of her mind. I can tell that you have sensed this as well. Let me loose and I will aid you in your efforts. Only together could we survive this. Now, only if you follow my lead. The voice of Maul echoes through her mind, through the Force. In your dreams, Maul, Ahsoka replies. Meanwhile, at the Jedi Temple holding facility, Anakin is being held captive and constrained. In this time, he silently meditates. In his meditative state, he reaches out and speaks with Palpatine. Palpatine, we need to rethink our strategy, Anakin says. Don't worry, my Anakin. I knew something like this would happen, Palpatine replied. What do you mean? I've called upon troopers from all across the galaxy to attack the Jedi Temple once more. I will not fail you again, Master. I think you've done enough. I'll handle this myself. Master, wait. As Anakin wakes up, he's interrupted by two 501st guards. Oi, could you be quiet down there? You'll regret this, Anakin remarks. Being commanded by you is already our biggest regret. I don't think that this is a shot you want to top. The other clone replies to Anakin. After hearing about what had happened to Anakin, Padme decides that she needs to visit him and see what's going on inside of his head. When she arrives at the temple, the 501st strippers at the door, along with the Jedi Temple Guards, are hesitant to allow her passage into the temple. I'm sorry, Senator. We aren't allowing anybody in. The 501st soldier says to Padme when she arrives. I'm good friends with General Skywalker. I just want to see that he's okay, Padme replies. The trooper looks towards the guard who waves her forward. He remains silent behind his mask, a beacon of stability for the other Jedi, one who is entrusted with the sacred duty of ensuring that no intruders would pass into the ancient halls of the temple. Well, I guess that we can make an exception for you, Senator Amidala. I'll escort you to Skywalker, the clone says. Padme thanks him, and the crowd of guards at the door parts momentarily for the pair. They enter the temple and Padme is shocked by the transformation that it's undergone. Rather than there being the serene training and meditation environment that she had become accustomed to, the temple was now a war room. 501st troopers escorted various masters through the halls. Younglings were being cared for by Keller and Beck and other masters who worked frequently with the children. Beck says hello to the clone troopers as they passes him, and he informs the clone that's with Padme that he had gotten in contact with Yoda and Obi-Wan, who would be at the temple in a matter of days. However, he tells the trooper to be on alert. Yoda had sensed a plot to destroy the Jedi at the temple, so they needed to be ready. In addition to this, countless meetings were being held with holographic projections of the galaxy, along with Coruscant. Many of the clones salute Padme out of respect, even though they aren't obligated to. It's quite the sight to see. Eventually, Padme ventures into the bowels of the temple with her clone escort. At the entrance to the Jedi Brig is a 501st guard who stands diligently on duty, ready to protect the prison from intruders. Hey there, Gusty. The General's called a visitor. Padme's escort greets the clone on guard. She notices that he has wind painted onto his helmet, and she wonders about the story behind the nickname. Nah, I'm sorry, Thrasher, but I have my orders. No visitors, Gusty responds. Padme's escort, the one whom Gusty had referred to as Thrasher, leans into his clone brother and speaks softly to him. Not even for an esteemed senator? He asks. Gusty glances at Padme. She nods at him, mustering her sense of natural authority and command to try and sway the clone. 
After a moment of silence, Gusty sighs. Fine, I guess I can make an exception. You got her in, I guess. But I want your eye on both of them the whole time, you hear? I don't want to be getting in any trouble, he states. Thrasher chuckles. Yeah, I hear ya. Thanks, brother. Don't make me regret it. Gusty groans playfully before opening the door to the rest of the cells. He's in 2187. Thrasher looks back and thanks Gusty for his help once more before venturing down the dark hallways with the senator. Padme's eyes shift around the small detention block and an anxious knot starts forming in her stomach. I hope that Skywalker will hear you out, Thrasher states. Me too, trooper. Me too. Eventually, after what feels like forever, the pair reach cell 2187. There, in the dank darkness of the Jedi Brig, sits Anakin Skywalker, cross-legged and eyes closed. It's clear that he's in a deep, meditative state, and Padme wonders if he even knows that she's there. Hello, Padme. Anakin coos. You've come to change my mind, I presume. Meanwhile, on the other side of the galaxy, Ahsoka and Rex regroup on Mandalore. Bo-Katan is happy to have them back. When Ahsoka lands on the surface with Rex, Jesse, and a small contingent of other clones, they start to receive dirty looks from the Mandalorian population as they walk through the streets with Bo. Don't worry about them. They're still a little bit shaken up after the siege, Bo says, attempting to console Ahsoka. Ahsoka's face is still set in a frown, but she makes it appear as though she doesn't care. We'll be out of your hair as soon as we can be. We just need to know whether or not we have allies to help us. Mandalore is a good, neutral meeting place, Ahsoka replies. Bo pauses for a moment, her brow furrowed, before speaking again. You know, Ahsoka, there would be some Mandalorians from the Night Owls who would be happy to help you out. Ahsoka shakes her head momentarily. No, I couldn't accept that. Your people need support. The Night Owls are meant to be here right now. Bo inclines her head slightly. It would only be honorable, Ahsoka. You helped us. Now it's our turn to help you. Ahsoka looks at Rex, who nods at her. We could use the bodies, Commander Tano. Ahsoka exhaled, and she looks directly at Bo in the eyes. I'll get your troops back to you safe and sound, Lady Kreez. Bo smiles. I know you will, Ahsoka. We'll only be here for a couple of days, Rex informs Bo. I know at least one squad that heard our message, and they're coming to help. Bo smiles. Stay as long as you need, Rex. My home is your home during these difficult times. Rex comes to attention and salutes sharply. Thank you, Lady Kreez. Shortly after this exchange, the contingent returns to their ship. Upon arriving back on the Republic Venator, Ahsoka can feel Maul reaching out to her in the Force again, knowing exactly what the criminal mastermind wants to tell her. Ahsoka pushes the calling out of her mind. There would be absolutely no way that Maul would be helping them in this situation, unless something were to go drastically wrong. Padme is taken aback, but she holds her ground. Hello there, Anakin, she replies curtly. They brought a trooper with you? They distrust me that much? Fools. My master will soon be here to free me. Of that, I have no doubt. I will be out of prison in the near future. Anakin pauses, taking a break to open his eyes and stand. And when he does, you traitorous clones will see the full might of the Empire which you have now forsaken. Anakin reaches out with a force, grabbing Thrasher by the neck and choking him. Anakin, stop! Palpatine's corrupted you! You have this all wrong! Padme cries. No, Padme. I have seen the light. The Jedi are evil. They sought to tear down the Republic and build it in their own image. Palpatine is the only way to a truly safe, secure, and free society. And he'll teach me to save you, Padme. He'll teach me the answers to everything! Anakin continues to tighten his grip. Thrasher chokes audibly, gasping and grasping at his neck. One day, I'll be powerful enough to overthrow Palpatine, and we can rule the galaxy together. We'll make things the way that we've always wanted them to, Padme. We'll create a galaxy that our children can be proud of. Padme shakes her head, her eyes filling with tears. You're not the Anakin that I once knew. You've changed. Anakin drops Thrasher, who gasps for breath. Maybe I've just seen something that you're still too blind to. Anakin responds, sulking back into the corner of his cell. Padme once again shakes her head, and she turns away, not saying another word to Anakin. Thrasher walks alongside her. The boys won't be happy to hear about this one, Thrasher utters, rubbing his neck. Padme remains silent, as if she's deep in thought about her husband's perspective on the Force. When Thrasher tells the other 501st troops about this exchange, they're flabbergasted. General Skywalker would never do something like that to one of his men. 
However, it was clear that this man was not General Skywalker. It was Vader, Palpatine's new pet. After some time waiting, Bail Organa is able to stealthily drop Yoda and Obi-Wan off at the temple before returning to the Senate building for Palpatine's special address to the galaxy. This time, rather than being greeted by Thrasher at the gates, the Jedi are welcomed by Sergeant Apo. Ah, General Kenobi, General Yoda, they're expecting your arrival, Apo says to them at the gate. Apo waves over another clone soldier, and he tells him to take over while he's gone. Apo leads Obi-Wan and Yoda to the main war room, where a massive map of the temple is present. Keller and Beck appears to be leading the meeting. Sorry to interrupt you, Master, but we have some visitors, Apo says as Keller and finishes the sentence. The Jedi present are elated to see Yoda and Obi-Wan. Their eyes light up and a sense of hope is palpable throughout the room. Oh, this bother you, do not. Good to see you all, it is, Yoda comments. Obi-Wan smiles and waves before saying a brief hello there to the group. It appeared that the Jedi were already deep into their strategy meeting. Intel from both Senator Amidala and Senator Organa had informed them of Palpatine's address to the Senate, after which they anticipated a massive assault would be launched on the temple. They had already constructed new barriers, brought in 501st E-Web cannons, and had started creating defensive formations throughout the temple. Help you however we can, we will, Yoda remarks. I've also been informed by the newly promoted Commander Rex that they'll have reinforcements coming for us soon. Apo informs those in the briefing. Hopefully, sooner than we anticipate, but don't expect any miracles. Obi-Wan has one burning question on his mind that he's been waiting to ask for the entire briefing. Where's Anakin? The 501st in the room look at each other uncomfortably. They whisper to one another, wondering who's going to break the news. Eventually, Apo speaks up. Ugh. General, I'm sorry to be the first to inform you. However, we placed Anakin in the temple's break. He's under close observation by the 501st at the moment. Senator Amadala still has hope for him, but, well, Apple pauses for a moment, clenching his fist. He's changed. He's off for Palpatine's new empire. He's brainwashed. That Slimo has Skywalker wrapped around his finger. Once again, Apple pauses. General Kenobi, he tried to kill one of my men. Only Senator Amidala was able to talk him down. Respectfully, I will not be welcoming him back among my men unless he can clean up his act. The 501st troopers nod and exclaim in agreement. Nobody hurts our brothers! One of them yells. This is met with scattered applause from the rest of the clones in the room. Obi-Wan strokes his beard, processing what he's just heard. Hope for his return to the light. We will. Yoda grunts. The plans were set. Soon, the battle would commence. On Mandalore, the Bad Batch quickly rendezvous with the 501st. They park their marauder in the hangar of the Venator and they meet with Rex when they disembark. Rex, it's good to see you again, Hunter says with a goofy grin on his face. Rex smiles too. I'm glad to see you too, Hunter. Your crew looks well. I'm glad that you listened to our call for help. Seems like most clones still have their chips in and listen to the order. Hunter looks at him slightly puzzled. We still have our chips in, but we didn't kill any Jedi. Rex's smile immediately turns to a frown. We're getting you to sick bay right now. As long as you have them in, the possibility of executing Order 66 is still there. The Bad Batch undergoes the process of removing their chips, just like Rex had earlier in the Clone Wars. Crosshair, however, when it's his turn, intimidates the droid. Don't you dare touch me, droid. He growls. After this, following his programming, he contacts Coruscant and informs him of the traitors on Mandalore. They thank him for the intel, and Crosshair rejoins his brothers. Judas had made his move. Now, it was time to see how things would play out when they arrived on the giant city planet. After the surgery, Rex tells Hunter about Crosshair. He was the only one who shot at the young Jedi on a mission, he says. I'm worried about him. Rex grunts slightly. We'll keep an eye on him. Now that you've got your chips out, I wouldn't worry as much about it. You never know, though. While Rex greets the Batch, Ahsoka goes into the brig, finding Maul in the giant device with which the Mandalorians had given Ahsoka to transport the criminal. I just thought I'd let you know that we're going to Coruscant. Soon, you'll stand trial for your crimes there. Justice will be served, she tells him. Maul, while unable to speak in this device, once more reaches out to Ahsoka through the Force, desperately trying to change her mind about helping. Not a chance, Maul, she says, sensing his emotions. Then she leaves him, still adamant about not allowing him to fight when the time came.
The intelligence of the 501st was correct. As soon as Palpatine gives his grand speech to the Senate about the formation of the Empire, the march towards the Jedi Temple begins. When Palpatine told the Senate about how these traitorous clones had not followed through with the order to kill all of the Jedi, the Senate fully approves of Palpatine's attack. Tarkin, who has an extreme distaste for the clone soldiers, also takes pride in the fact that it would be his men garrisoned on Coruscant who would be leading the assault. For moments before the attack begins, everything at the temple is still. The Coruscant air feels dry and the clones begin to sweat through their armor. Apo stands alongside his brothers, ready to command them to victory. Thrasher and Gusty stand silent as sentries behind the sergeant, prepared for the inevitable battle that would soon break out. Even the Jedi, who are normally steadfast rocks of serenity, have a palpable sense of anxiety about them. After all, this would be the battle for the fate of their order. As soon as the LAAT gunships begin to arrive, offloading many troops onto the ground, a massive battle begins. Lasers flash through the sky, mowing down clones on both sides. The Jedi Sentinels at the door manage to hold back the ensuing wave of attackers, deflecting their bolts back at Palpatine's clones. The hordes of clones continue to advance though, and not even the esteemed 501st can hold them back for long. Apo is forced to tell them to retreat into the temple where there's more cover and where they can spring more traps on the encroaching forces. Once in the temple, the battle intensifies. The 501st are able to pick off many of the attackers with their e-web cannons that they have bottlenecked through the temple gates. They also immobilize many of the encroaching gunships. However, eventually these e-webs are consumed in flames as the gunships spot their position and take them out, destroying the 501st's big trap. In the temple, though, the Jedi Masters put up an incredible fight. Keller and Beck, Obi-Wan, Yoda, Syndrelic, and other remaining Masters swing their lightsabers in defense against the attackers, barely holding on as they're slowly pushed backwards by Palpatine's clone forces. In the midst of the attack, Thrasher is hit by a stray bolt from a Coruscant guard, led by Commander Fox. Thrasher! Gusty runs in to check on his friend, who's been hit in the chest. His ribs are collapsed and he's bleeding fast. I need a medic! Gusty yells. Thrasher coughs and shakes his head. Gussie removes his helmet, looking his friend directly in the eyes. There's others who need more attention and have more of a shot at living than I do. Thrasher says softly, Fox's boys can shoot. I'll give him that. Gussie continues to panic, trying to call for medic and patch Thrasher's wound. Thrasher's face continues to go pale as blood soaks through his soldier fatigues. It's been an honor, Gusty. Thrasher says, the clone soldier takes one last breath before going still, passing on to the next life. No, Thrasha! No! Gusty exclaims, kneeling over the body. Apo comes up behind Gusty. Come on, soldier. Your friend did everything that he could. He was a good warrior and an even better man. It's time to fight for him now. Gusty rises and continues to battle, a newfound vigor in his spirit. Now he would fight for his fallen brothers in arms. Meanwhile, above the skies in Coruscant, Palpatine had ordered a blockade of the sky after hearing word of potential reinforcements for the Jedi that had come from Crosshair. When Rex and Ahsoka arrive with the reinforcements, they aren't expecting the blockade. Admiral Yularen commands the Venator at the head of the fleet, and he immediately orders that they fire upon the advancing ships. The officers on Ahsoka's Venator turn the shields up and they start a counteroffensive. While they're outnumbered, the Mandalorian backup is ferocious. The gauntlet starfighters weave through the clone ARC-170s quite easily, and they're able to maneuver swiftly between the gaps of the Venators due to their unique build. Rex and Ahsoka manage to squeeze through with their Mandalorian navigators. However, rather than go to assist in the battle, the two of them receive an odd call from Apo. Commander Rex, we need your reinforcements. However, you've been requested elsewhere. As it turned out, the soldiers on the ground had just received a call that Senator Amidala had started going into labor in the apartment complex. Ahsoka and Rex are needed to help her and ensure her safety. The rest of the Mandalorians soar into action above the temple, but Ahsoka and Rex are rerouted to Padme's apartment. Well, Commander, I never thought I'd be doing this in my lifetime, Rex says as they land outside of her building. Me neither, Rex. Me neither, she replies. Rex and the Mandalorians that were on their ship wait outside of the apartment, ensuring that all exits are covered. Ahsoka goes to aid Senator Amidala to the best of her ability. The battle on Coruscant had taken a strange turn. One of the requests from the Jedi is that Maul be brought to the temple as well. They wanted to take care of him personally, especially since he had slaughtered multiple Jedi with his brother, Savage. The Mandalorians managed to battle through the attacking clones and find a safe spot in the temple, before finding a clone escort to bring them to the detention block with the massive machine. Maul is placed in detention, ready to succumb to whatever fate awaits him at the temple. Funny enough, by some miracle of the force, Maul's cell is right next to Anakin's. He begins talking to him just like he did with Ahsoka through the force.
Why, if it isn't Palpatine's new favorite pets. Maul speaks snidely to Anakin. Anakin turns to Maul and tries to intimidate him. Who do you think you are? Maul replies, I am what came before you, my friend. What are you talking about? Do you believe in the phrase, history repeats itself? Quit your jibber jabber, who are you? I am your history, your reflection. I am what you've become and what you are if you follow down this path. I was once an apprentice of Sidious myself. And here we are, together, in the same dungeon. This is no coincidence. You let him use you like a pawn, and you are bound to be thrown away like one. My master will come back, Anakin retorts. Oh, I suppose he might. But what would you think he would think of you, down here in this cell? You are not weak, Skywalker. You are one of the most powerful force users that the galaxy has ever seen. You should know that you are much more of an ally to him than you are as a threat. You are more useful rotting in here than aiding his disgusting empire. Anakin stood as Maul's claim seemed to be true. Suddenly, he hears the cries of children being born to the force. Padme! Ah, oh, oh, the miracle of birth. I feel sorry for you missing such a pivotal moment. I need to get to Padme. With what army, Skywalker? Palpatine is probably waiting with millions of troopers outside these doors. Anakin steps back, frustrated. Let me help you. I have the power to change the tide of this battle. Every choice that you have made has led you to this moment, Skywalker. Anakin, now desperate, unleashes a large burst of force energy in the cell, which breaks barriers and bars as if a grenade had been set off in his quarters. He's motivated by his love for Padme and his disgust for Palpatine. Anakin also goes and lets Maul out of his cell. Right, now just follow- I will follow nobody, young Skywalker. It is time for me to follow my own destiny. I shall see you when the time comes, Jedi friend. Maul runs away, ensuring that he grabs his saber staff from the security station on the way out of the cell. Anakin shakes his head, but he knows that he'll see the Dathomirian in the battle above. When Anakin gets to the main level of the temple, he's immediately met with a storm of chaos. The 501st is embroiled in a battle with various legions of clone troopers, and so are the Jedi. Anakin sees a group of younglings going to face to face with a group of Coruscant guards, and he uses the force to speed run over to them. Anakin pushes the groups of clones away, knocking them into a nearby pillar. The younglings look at Anakin expectantly, their eyes filled with fear. Don't worry, we'll get you out of here, Anakin says. Anakin sees Sergeant Apple nearby and he calls out to him. The clone looks over at Anakin, and he slowly walks over. How did you get out of containment, General? Apple asks with some venom in his voice. It doesn't matter. I need you to get these younglings to safety. I trust you, Apple. I know that you'll get the job done. Apple looks at Skywalker for a moment, sizing him up. Just a few days ago, you wanted to kill these younglings, sir, he says. Yes, and, and now I want them saved. I need you to do this for me, Apple, even if you don't trust me. Do it for the kids. The sergeant pauses. There's a moment of consideration from Apple as he wonders what Anakin's angle is. There's no angle here, Apple. Just do it for the kids. Finally, the sergeant nods. Yes, General. Come on, kids. Let's get you out of here. Apple waves down a squad of 501st troopers and takes them with him. They form a protective ring around the younglings, and they end up moving out of Anakin's line of sight. He joins the battle, seeing his old friend Obi-Wan across the battlefield. Ah, Anakin, I see they finally let you out of jail. Obi-Wan says sarcastically. Anakin smirks. Well, let out me be a bit of my stretch, my old master, but I'm here now, he replies. Anakin can also see Maul nearby fighting alongside Yoda and Sindralig. Anakin hopes that he'll see the error in his ways one day, but he doubts it. Maul seems to be too far gone. Nearby, Ahsoka helps Padme deliver her children with Rex and the Mandalorian standing vigilantly on guard outside of the room. Ahsoka is a calming presence in the Force, and she's able to help Padme through the pain. In the end, she's there when Padme names the twins, and she couldn't be happier to share this moment with her old friend. Ahsoka senses Anakin's turn in the Force, too, and she knows that her master was going to be okay after all. Ahsoka tells this to Padme, who lets out a sigh of relief. Perhaps she had gotten to him after all. 
Finally, the Jedi start to gain some ground in their fight. The core group of them, along with a few Padawans and younglings, manage to escape with the Mandalorians in one of the Marauder starships. Jesse takes a small contingent of clones aboard his ship too, and they head straight to the Chancellor's office. Maul manages to get on this ship as well. Nobody expects it when they barge into the Senate, full guns blazing. Perhaps Palpatine had made a strategic error when he had sent all of his backup to aid at the temple. The group makes their way through the halls of the Senate, blasting any guard who dared challenge them. When they reach the Chancellor's office, he appears to be waiting for them, alone with the door wide open. Ah, my old Jedi comrades, Yoda, Obi-Wan, Keller, and Sin, and their little warrior friends. I've been waiting for you. Palpatine cackles before unleashing a barrage of Sith lightning upon the attackers. This catches the clones off guard, who are instantly fried in their armor, including Jesse. The Bad Batch, though, who managed to make it here as well, dodge out of the way, avoiding the lightning onslaught, but just barely. The Mandalorians, who wear Baskar, are caught off guard, but they're able to take the blow much better than the clones. The Jedi are still able to deflect the blast with their sabers. Jesse! Anakin yells, going to the side of his fallen soldier. Sadly, Jesse had perished as soon as the bolt had hit him. In this moment, too, Crosshair turns on his Bad Batch friends. Good soldiers follow orders, he says, raising his sniper to try and take them out. However, Wrecker, seeing this in action, goes and charges Crosshair, pinning him to the floor and knocking him unconscious with a swift blow to the head. Ah, what are you doing, Crosshair? I thought you took your chip out. Ah, I guess not. Crosshair smiles a sly grin. Oh, you're too trusting, Crosshair. Good soldiers follow orders. Good soldiers follow orders. As this is going on, Palpatine begins talking as well. Ah, I see that two of my former apprentices are here as well. Vader and Maul, both so much potential, yet so... weak. Anakin charges in, ready to take on his old master. However, he's once again halted by a blast of purple electricity. You're a traitor, Skywalker. And you, Maul. Palpatine turns to the Dathomirian. You are nothing to me. The Jedi take this moment to charge at Sidious. He dances with them, pulling out his saber and deflecting their attacks. Sidious cackles as he parries their blows. However, the blasts from the recovered Mandalorians, along with the strange form of Maul with his twin-bladed saber, throw the Dark Lord off of his game for a little bit. You lied to me, screams Anakin, lunging at Palpatine. What? Did your new Dathomirian friend tell you that? City of scoffs, parrying his blow. Eventually, after fighting hard with so many experienced duelists and Mandalorian warriors, Palpatine starts to feel drained. He slows down, and Anakin takes advantage of the situation. He unleashes a barrage of ferocious lightsaber attacks, and Palpatine is unable to contain his apprentice. Anakin lets out a guttural battle cry and slices off Palpatine's hands, just like he did with Dooku. He then stands above the old Chancellor, huffing and puffing from exhaustion. Hugh are under arrest, Anakin says, pointing his lightsaber at the Sith Lord's throat. Are you going to kill me? Palpatine cackles, a perverse smile curling on his lips. You must stand trial. The Senate will decide your fate, Anakin says in response. However, Yoda lets out a grunt of his own. Far too dangerous, this man is. Destroy him to bring peace to the Republic. We must. Anakin shakes his head. None of us are above the law. Only the government can decide his fate. Maul shakes his head. I grow tired of this discourse, he says. Before anyone knows what's happening, Maul throws his double-bladed saber. It cuts through the air, and not even the Grand Master of the Jedi Order makes an effort to stop it. Palpatine, who had been so focused on his hatred for the Jedi that he'd forgotten about Maul, is taken aback by this, and the expression on his face is one of stunned surprise when the saber staff decapitates him. Anakin glares at Maul. What? Somebody had to do it, the criminal mastermind says, a large smirk on his face. It's not the Jedi way, Anakin replies, addressing his Jedi comrades and Maul simultaneously. Maul chuckles. Well, it's a very good thing that I'm no Jedi then. For a moment, before all the clones rush in and see the Emperor's body on the ground, there's a moment of perfect stillness. Everyone catches their breath, wondering what would come next. Everything seemed to be at peace. At the end of the day, the Jedi Order survives. However, Anakin can't stand their decision to try and kill Palpatine without a fair trial. 
Even though they don't take over the Republic, Anakin still holds the values of the Republic dear, especially when he didn't want to be seduced by an authoritarian again, as he did with Palpatine. He knows that he, they would disapprove of him having a family and mixed loyalties anyway, so Anakin decides that it's best to leave the Order. Yoda also can't stand Yoda wanting to kill Palpatine and doing nothing to stop Maul, even when he probably could have. Anakin goes back to Naboo with his family, ready to raise their children and teach them the ways of the Force the way that he wanted to. In the Senate, Padme decides to take a step away from her duties so that she can be a mother to her children. In her stead, Jar Jar once again takes the position as representative. He ends up nominating himself for Chancellor, and he wins, turning the galaxy into a Gungan dictatorship. He saw a bombad Sith Lord, you know. <laughs> Just kidding, that doesn't actually happen. Instead, he supports Mon Mothma's bid for the Chancellorship, which is a move that many other senators also take. In the end, she's elected and begins a demilitarization campaign of the Republic. The clones are decommissioned and retired with handsome pensions and voter rights, thanks to the additions to the militarization bill added by Senator Chuchi. Rex, once he retires, is appointed to be a security advisor to the Chancellor herself, and he still gets the chance to be the soldier that he was raised to be. Mon Mothma also negotiates peace with the remaining Separatist leaders. Since Anakin never had a chance to kill the Corporate Council and Mustafar, they still want their demands heeded. Mon Mothma, being the pacifist that she is, manages to satisfy the Separatist Parliament's desires to secede. She keeps the Republic together by promising that they wouldn't be neglected by the central government nearly as much. She also promises further regulations on mega corporations, which does not make folks like Newt Gunray happy, but it does satisfy the politicians who want more freedom. So a treaty is signed and the Republic is kept together. Maul, who had helped liberate the Jedi, is put on trial for his crimes earlier in the Clone Wars. However, he's given a reduced sentence. While well, he'd committed unspeakable atrocities as the leader of the Shadow Collective, he had also aided in the deposition of a maniacal dictator. The Senate also orders that Maul be given psychiatric treatment under the supervision of Yoda, as they had determined that his mind was severely damaged. They also hoped that this might bring him to the light. At the end of the day, because of the 501st's allegiance to the Jedi and the true essence of the Republic, things turn out differently for the galaxy. With perhaps some luck of the forks mixed in, the peace resumes throughout the galaxy. Things look up for our heroes, and the light prevails. Hey there folks, this week's question from the Discord server is from Darth Malgus, and his question to me is what is my favorite what if that I've made? And well, honestly, my favorite what if that I've made on this channel is what if Vader ruled Tatooine. Oh, it was such a fun one to make. I loved the creative freedom that I got with that one, and it was so cool. I would have to say the runner up is Dooku's being the Chancellor of the Republic, and then following that, what if the Separatists won? And fourth, of course, this one was probably up there with me too, what if Trump was Chancellor? All of these have been so much fun to make, and they have been an absolute privilege to write and voice for you guys. So thanks again for your support. I have loved making these videos, and I look forward to making more in the future. Speaking of videos, thank you for watching this one. I really hope that you enjoyed today's video. If you did, I would recommend checking out this other video, which is what if the Jedi had taken over the Republic. If you guys have any comments, please leave them down below. Would you like to see a part two? If so, what do you think would happen in the second part? Let me know in the comments. We also have an incredibly vibrant Discord that is growing by the day. I would recommend that you join so that you can see this awesome community of people that we have and also you can interact with me more frequently. I hope that each and every one of you has an absolutely banthatastic day. And as always, I hope that you've had your daily delicious dose of bantha stew.